Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to lecture three in physiological psychology. Uh, here we're going to talk about the structure of nervous systems. Uh, in the first part we'll talk about the structures that are kind of surrounding the nervous tissue both outside and in. Those will be the meninges uh, and the ventricles. These are going to uh, protect the brain uh, either by creating a tough barrier or by creating a soft fluid cushion. Uh, then we'll go over uh, the portions of the central nervous system. So we'll quickly to cover we'll quickly cover development uh, in no real detail whatsoever. And then we'll talk about the major divisions of our central nervous system and get a basic overview of their function. We'll touch on these functions in greater detail later on in the class. Then we'll cover the peripheral nervous system. So the parts outside of our brain and spinal cord. So the, the, all of our nervous tissue is going to be encased uh, in these um, membranes called meninges. And there's a few different meninges. Uh, then there, there will be the uh, cerebrospinal fluid that's contained uh, within the meninges and then also within uh, these large cavities called ventricles. Uh, the cerebrospinal fluid is going to help us uh, by creating a, sort of a cushion as well as allowing the diffusion of nutrients and, and waste material. So first, just a couple of key terms. Um, we'll need to know how to relate different structures to one another. And, and there are a few different terms uh, that we use for this. So there's anterior and posterior. Anterior would mean toward the front and posterior would mean toward the back. Now, something to keep in mind is that as bipeds, our, our brains are rotated 90 degrees relative to the rest of our body. So the terms that we use to describe direction in our head won't necessarily be the same um, as what we'll use in our spinal cord. Uh, so for example, the anterior portion of our brain will be toward the front. It's also called rostral. Anterior and rostral are pretty much interchangeable as our posterior and caudal. So the part of your brain closest to your nose or your eyes that would be the anterior or rostral portion and the posterior or caudal portion of your brain will be toward the back of the head. In the spinal cord uh, it's a little different because that 90 degree rotation the anterior portion of the spinal cord will be toward the brain and the posterior portion will be uh, the portions away from the brain. This makes the terms dorsal and ventral uh, also different. Dorsal, uh, here you should be thinking dorsal fin, that's on the back. So dorsal uh, means toward the back in the spinal cord, uh, but of course our brains are rotated 90 degrees. So our back is really now toward the top. So the dorsal portion of your brain uh, would be at the top of your head and the ventral portion would be at the bottom of the brain. Whereas the spinal cord will have the dorsal portion facing toward your back and the ventral portion facing toward your chest. The terms lateral and, and medial don't change at all. Whether you're in the brain or the spinal cord, lateral is always toward the edges and the medial portion would be toward the center. And because we have these different uh, directions, that means that we can also have different planes that we're going to think about the brain in. Um, one of the planes, so if you were to, if you were to slice uh, through the traverse plane there, you'd create a frontal or more commonly a coronal section. So if you see the uh, top slice through the brain there, showing you the uh, dorsal part on top, the ventral on the bottom, there are the lateral parts on the side and the medial portion in the center. That top slice is showing you a frontal section or a coronal section, same thing. A horizontal section is shown on the bottom. This is a slice going through the horizon essentially. Uh, and here you can see the anterior and posterior. Uh, we can't distinguish dorsal and ventral so much because the horizontal plane uh, is, is running in that direction. So we can't tell dorsal and ventral. This is just a slice. Um, the sagittal plane is if you were to slice along uh, the midline 
or anywhere lateral from that. That will be a sagittal or parasagittal plane. So that's the middle section uh, that we see on the right. Now the sides are important uh, to keep in mind as well. Sometimes you'll hear the term ipsilateral and then sometimes you'll hear the term contralateral. Ipsilateral deals with the same side whereas contralateral deals with the opposite side of the body. For example, our brains uh, tend to control the contralateral side of the body yet the ipsilateral side of the face. So the left portions of our brain will control the right sides of our body but usually the left side of the face. So ipsilateral, same side, contralateral, other side. Now the entire nervous system uh, we're going to divide into two different parts. The central nervous system uh, shown here would be the brain and the spinal cord, that would be the yellow portions, and then the peripheral nervous system would be the nerves that uh, radiate outside of our central nervous system. So all the nerves that allow us to control our muscles or that bring uh, sensory information to the brain or spinal cord, those would be parts of the peripheral nervous system. So the central nervous system is going to be more like the computational uh, center of the nervous system, whereas the peripheral nervous system is the input and output for this computational unit. Uh, we'll talk about the divisions of these in the uh, next two portions of the lecture. Our nervous system is uh, going to need some protection because the cells in it are so delicate. Um, Aside from the skull or the vertebra, there are also uh, these tough membranes called meninges that cover the nervous system. The outermost is called the dura mater, uh, which is uh, actually very difficult um, and very hard uh, covering. So it's, it can be very tough to cut through. Uh, unlike the pia mater, that's a very thin membrane that you can easily strip off. It tears. Uh, whether you want it to or not, but the dura mater is a, a, a lot more leathery and tough. Now in between the dura mater, which is the outer covering, and the pia mater, which is attached to the surface of our brain and spinal, spinal cord, we have the arachnoid membrane, which is kind of spongy um, and, and filled with fluid called cerebrospinal fluid. So the arachnoid membrane is kind of like a sponge, so that means it has space in it called the arachnoid, or the subarachnoid space. And so this is going to be a fluid-filled portion that's going to create an, a cushion outside of our brain and spinal cord. So in addition to the bone, we also have this uh, fluid-filled uh, covering that's protected by the dura mater and then attached to the brain via the pia mater. Now that fluid there, the cerebrospinal fluid, that's going to not just surround our brain, it's also going to flow through it uh, in our ventricular system. So we're going to create uh, cerebrospinal fluid in the brain uh, from our blood. So remember that the, the, the brain, like all of our other tissues, is alive and thus it gets ample blood supply. Uh, in fact, the, the brain gets uh, uh, a much greater uh, degree of blood supply than you'd imagine just based on its weight. And that's because the, the cells there are very active. So because of all that blood being there, uh, we, have, we have plenty of building material to create cerebrospinal fluid. This is going to be carried out not by neurons, of course. Uh, neurons are kept away from blood, so these will be specialized glial cells called ependymal cells. They create a tissue called the choroid plexus. And the choroid plexus is kind of found in, in all of our ventricles, uh, this choroid plexus is going to uh, create cerebrospinal fluid by removing specific parts of the blood uh, to create this salty, sugary fluid uh, that is cerebrospinal fluid. And then that is going to be circulated through our ventricles. Uh, so the cer cerebrospinal fluid that's created in our lateral ventricles, those would be the big ones on the side. If you look in, in panels B and C there, you can see the very large lateral ventricles. Uh, again, they're lateral because they're not along the midline, unlike the third and fourth ventricles, which are in the middle. The lateral ventricles go off to the sides. The CSF is going to flow from the lateral ventricles into the third ventricle, then uh, from the third to the fourth, and then it will kind of uh, 
permeate around the brain as well as through the spinal cord. Now when the CSF moves around the brain, it's going to uh, come back in contact with blood vessels in the uh, arachnoid granulations. These are just little um, projections of our arachnoid uh, membrane and they're going to contain blood vessels that will reabsorb the CSF. So we're always making fresh cerebrospinal fluid and then we're removing the old cerebrospinal fluid after it's bathed over our nervous system. So there's a constant uh, production uh, as well as reabsorption of this cerebrospinal fluid and that allows us to maintain a relatively stable total volume of 125 to 150 milliliters. Um, when the when the reabsorption uh, doesn't occur normally you get what we call hydrocephalus which just means water head uh, so if there's an obstruction that prevents CSF from flowing into those uh, arachnoid uh, granulations and getting reabsorbed then the fluid will just um, will build up in the head and this is going to increase uh, the pressure it's going to push out the skull and you can see here that this this young baby has a, a very massively enlarged skull that's because it's filled with fluid this is uh, fairly easily treatable you need to just uh, install a shunt so you put in uh, a probe into the ventricles the lateral ventricles are going to be targeted because uh, of their large size this will allow the fluid to drain and it's actually routed down into the abdominal cavity where it can be reabsorbed into the blood supply there so this, this prevents the fluid from building up and damaging our nervous tissue. Now the, the brain itself is going to be uh, further divided into many different regions which are all going to have different functions. What we're going to see there is when we move from the bottom of the brain up to the, up to the top, we're going to go from uh, very basic vital functions to more complicated functions. All right, so the lowest portion, the brain stem, is going to control things like breathing, uh, whereas the, the topmost parts, like our cortex, is going to control things uh, like our consciousness. <clears throat> now, we all start off as a little flat disc that turns into a tube. Uh, hopefully this uh, movie is playing for you. So what we're going to see here is that this little flat disc uh, is going to uh, create a, a groove in the middle. Uh, this is what we call the primitive streak. And uh, around this, we're going to develop uh, the tissue that will uh, eventually become our nervous system. All right, so we're, uh, we're expanding now. We're creating this, uh, this neural groove, which is going to get pulled inward, and we're going to go from a disc to a tube. Okay, it's a little difficult to see in this animation, um, but here the, the neural groove is getting pulled inward, and the uh, neural folds there are going to come together. It's going to pinch off and create a neural tube inside of this embryo, and they're going to rotate this now, and you'll get your your uh, kind of prototypical uh, embryo here that we're, we're used to seeing. There's the head on top, there's the tail on the bottom, and inside of this embryo now we have our future central nervous system uh, comprising the brain and the spinal cord. Now this brain doesn't look much like a brain yet, uh, but it will. So the invagination of the, the uh, neural plate there is is better seen in in this schematic here so the purple portion is showing us our future nervous system remember we all start off as kind of a a sheet of cells and what we're going to do is pull in that sheet to create a tube uh, our nervous system and our skin are derived from the same embryonic tissue we just pull in part of our um, ectoderm in order to create the nervous system and that's the purple part so as we go through neurulation that's where we're pulling in that part of our outer covering to create the neural tube so we go from a flat sheet uh, in the very top 
as we move down, we're, you can see we're pulling in that neural plate. We're creating the neural groove. And those neural folds shown in green are going to get butted up next to one another. Then the central portion, that future neural tube, is pulled down inside. Uh, the green cells will fuse together. The blue cells will become our skin. They will also fuse together to create a continuous sheet of skin surrounding that neural tube. And that neural tube is going to form different parts of our central nervous system depending on where it is in the body. So here we can see the development of that neural tube. Of course, with some fairly large leaps. On the left, uh, top and bottom, we're seeing the same uh, stage in development, just different views. They're showing you a cross section on the bottom, uh, and they're showing you the uh, outer view on top. So. As we move from left to right, we're moving through development. Okay, so we're just a very simple tube with a few empty chambers whenever our nervous system first starts off. Then that uh, neural tube is going to grow, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to swell up in some parts to create these big, giant, complicated structures, which we'll go through in today's lecture. So we go from a sheet to a tube, and then we go from a simple tube with a couple of swellings uh, into this fully formed adult brain shown on the right. So you can see there's three major divisions, the, the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain. Those are going to give rise to all the different parts of our brain. That forebrain uh, is, is going to create our telencephalon uh, and the, the diencephalon. The midbrain will form the, the mesencephalon, and then the hindbrain is going to make the uh, metencephalon and my, myelencephalon. So those chambers, those holes uh, in the middle of our neural tube, those are going to go on and become the ventricles that we've already discussed, and that surrounding tissue is going to expand to create all of our central nervous system. Our brains, uh, like the rest of our body, is made of a, a bunch of cells, and so the way that our brains grow is through cell division. So as our nervous system is developing, uh, there are these cells called neuroblasts that are going to divide in one of two ways. Neuroblasts are the precursor cells for our neurons. And these neuroblasts can either divide symmetrically, meaning they create two equal cells, two clones of one another, that are both going to be neuroblasts. So if you're going to make a bigger brain, you need more rounds of symmetric division to give you a greater number of neuroblasts or a greater number of stem cells. We can also divide asymmetrically. Now, when you've learned about cell division, what you've learned about in your classes has always been symmetric division. One cell divides, and you get two identical cells. This depends on where we set up uh, our mitotic uh, axis. So in, in symmetric cell division, we're going to set it up so that the two daughter cells get uh, equal parts of all their cellular machinery. In asymmetric cell division, uh, we rotate the axis so that we create two different cells. One cell is going to retain that machinery needed to, to remain a stem cell. So that'll be a, a new neuroblast. So in this case, a neuroblast divides and it makes one neuroblast but then the other cell doesn't receive any of the stem cell machinery. So that allows it to dif differentiate and become a neuron. So this is how we can create ganglion mother cells. Because cells will put different uh, components in different parts of the cell. So by rotating the mitotic axis, you can create two cells that have completely different cellular machinery and thus have completely different functions. So symmetric division creates two new neuroblasts and makes bigger brains. The asymmetric division is going to then create the future neurons, the ganglion mother cells. Now when you look at a human brain, the most obvious portion of it would be the cerebral cortex. It's that wrinkly outer covering. And that's all, that, all cortex means is, is outer covering. So that, that wrinkly cover... Um, actually has a, a function of increasing the surface area because our, our cortex is actually a, a layered structure. And so when you're looking at these folds, 
what you're seeing is is a sheet that's essentially been crumpled up so that it fits into a smaller area. Okay, the cortex isn't actually a nucleus, um, it's, so it's not a ball of cells. Here it's a bunch of sheets of cells. And so this is going to create the outer sheets, which contain neuron cell bodies and their dendrites, and that's what we call gray matter. And that very outer covering is going to be connected to other regions of the brain through white matter. Uh, which gets its white color from all the myelin surrounding the axons that are connecting different brain regions. If we were to uh, look at that wrinkly cover there, and we were to slice through it, we'd see that there's actually uh, six different layers, and each layer is going to have different types of neurons there, um, if it contains neurons. The very outer layer actually doesn't contain any neurons. Those are just going to be a collection of dendrites and axons and very sparse glial cells. Layers two and three are going to contain uh, neurons that communicate with other parts of the cortex. Uh, layer two there is going to communicate with the cortex on the same side of the body, so the ipsilateral cortex, whereas layer three will communicate to the cortex on the other side of the brain, so the contralateral cortex. But both two and three are communicating with the cortex. So that's why they're called intracortical neurons. So these allow the cortex to communicate with different parts uh, and then construct uh, reality uh, using multiple senses. Because as we'll see, different parts of our cortex respond to different stimuli. So in order for our cortex to get a complete picture of what's going on, the different parts of the cortex have to communicate with one another. Layer four is where we're uh, going to receive input from uh, uh, the, the thalamus. Uh, you won't see a lot of cell bodies there. Uh, you'll see some glia, but you'll, you'll mainly just see the dendrites that are receiving the input. In layer five, you're going to see the largest uh, neurons that are going to project to uh, very distal uh, brain regions including the spinal cord and then uh, the brain stem to so the pons, medulla, the, the midbrain, uh, as well as other parts of the forebrain, uh, like the striatum, uh, but parts that are not in the cortex itself. So this is projecting outside of the cortex, but not to the thalamus. The thalamus receives input from layer six neurons. So we have this very orderly structure, no matter where you are in the cortex, Layer 6 neurons will project to the thalamus. No matter where you are in the cortex, layer 2 neurons are going to project to the ipsilateral cortex. And the, the way that we get these layered uh, structures is by building our cortex one layer at a time. So we're going to be laying down layers of neurons. The way that this, ha the way that this happens is through migration of cells. So remember, we have asymmetric cell division. Okay, uh, the the cells that give rise to our uh, future cortical neurons, at least the excitatory ones, those are called radial glia because they have these fibers that radiate out uh, from the bottom to the top of our cortex, and those radial glial fibers uh, create little roads that future neurons can crawl on. So when the radial glia undergo asymmetric cell division, one of the cells remains a radial glia, the other cell is a future neuron, and then that neuron crawls on that mother radial glial cell and settles at the edge. So early on in development, uh, we're producing the lowest uh, layers of the cortex. Let's step back and have a look at our layers. So we're going to build these layers one at a time in general, okay? Really, we, we differentiate the layers a bit later, but we build the bottom layers first, and then we build uh, the layers above that, and then above that. All right, and that's just through crawling of cells. Uh, hopefully the movie on the bottom left is working for you now. Here we can see a newborn neuron crawling along a radial glial fiber. If the movie's not playing uh, in the recording, then just simply follow the link in the slides. So after these new neurons are born through asymmetric cell division, they're no longer a radial glial cell. They didn't get any of that machinery. 
Instead, they inherited uh, the, the proteins that they needed to create uh, a new neuron. And they crawl along that radial glial fiber, they settle at the edge of the brain, and they create a new layer. Once the, once the cells find their location, then they grow out their axons and their dendrites. The dendrites uh, are going to grow through a variety of different mechanisms, but in general, what the dendrites want to do is spread out uniformly. That's essentially their job, and they do that through like repulsion. So if a dendrite encounters uh, another dendrite from the same cell, it just turns. It just adjusts how it's growing so that one neuron has a relatively uniform uh, dendritic arbor. The axon, on the other hand, doesn't just stay around the cell body. The axon might have to migrate a very, very long distance. And the way that it does this is by following little chemical cues called guidance cones. So the growing tip of the axon contains this structure called the growth cone, uh, which contains a variety of receptors that can pick up those guidance cues. And a guidance cue could be uh, a diffusive uh, a diffusible chemical or it could be a, another protein that's attached to a cell or the extracellular matrix. So these vary. They could, they could diffuse or they could remain in place. And depending on which receptors a growth cone has, it will either be attracted or repelled by different guidance cues. And this is what allows our axons to migrate uh, fairly substantial distances so that we can innervate our entire body. So the uh, growth cone here uh, contains, of course, cytoskeletal filaments that are controlled by those receptors. So depending on which guidance cue there is and which receptor, that's going to determine whether the cytoskeleton gets stabilized or destabilized. And if you stabilize the cytoskeleton, then you'll get growth in that direction. If you destabilize it, you will have the, the growth cone retreat from that direction. Hopefully this movie is playing for you. If it's not, follow the link below. Actin is the cytoskeletal filament shown in green. Tubulin is in red. Actin is at the periphery. And that arrow is indicating that they've released a guidance cue there. What you can see is that the actin cytoskeleton uh, first grows substantially, kind of in all directions, but then you're going to see it turn uh, toward that arrow. And that's because of the receptors there picking up the guidance cue and stabilizing the actin cytoskeleton that's closest to the guidance cue. All right, we'll watch this one more time. Tubulin will then follow actin. All right, actin is a lot more dynamic than tubulin. Tubulin stays down in the center, and the actin will see grow up along the edges of the growth cone. There it goes. It gets nice, bright green. But it's not just growing toward uh, the arrow. As you can see, it's also kind of sprouting off to the left. So after uh, the cell has time to... To pick up this guidance cue, you can see that the growth cone has now turned toward the right. As our brains expand, then the neuroblasts uh, get, get put into little distinct locations because once a neuron is created through asymmetric cell division, they no longer have that stem cell machinery. Neurons don't divide. A neuron will never go through cell division to create another neuron. That's the job of the stem cells. Now the excitatory cortical neurons, those are made from radial glia. We've already talked about that. But there's also inhibitory cortical neurons scattered uh, throughout our cortex. They're not made by radial glia. Instead, they're made in other uh, regions of the brain called the ganglionic eminences. These are uh, immediately ventral to our lateral ventricles, so they're just below them. The inhibitory neurons that are created there actually have to migrate long distances, and they migrate by following guidance cues, just like we saw for the growth cone there. So different neurons are going to be created in different parts of the brain, and sometimes they have to migrate fairly substantial distances to end up in their final resting place. Once we've gone through development and we have adult brains, we do still create new neurons, uh, but there's really only uh, two populations of cells that create them. There's the subventricular zone in our cerebrum, and then there's the uh, subgranular zone in the hippocampus. 
Um, Neurogenesis is limited in adulthood, but it certainly occurs. Okay, we can see very obvious evidence of this if we take an adult brain and we stain it for a marker of recent cell division. We can see that some of the neurons there, those are the red cells. Okay, in A and B, we're seeing this neuronal protein called new N. This is a, a protein that's created in the nuclei of neurons and not other cells. Only neurons make this. So any red blob that you're seeing there is a neuron. And you can see in part A they have an arrow showing you that this is a cell that also contains BRDU. BRDU is this uh, modified uh, nucleotide that we, we can identify with antibodies. So the green cell there is just simply a cell that has recently created its DNA. In other words, it's a newborn neuron. So we have a newborn neuron in an adult brain, but you can see here it's, it's the minority. Most of those neurons there haven't made their DNA recently, and that's because they were made early on in development uh, when this animal was still an embryo. Just as we must make cells in development, we must also remove them because the, um, the logic of our nervous system is to create an excess of neurons. We don't just make enough neurons so that we can uh, accurately map each part of our body only once. Okay, uh, Because if something goes wrong with that one neuron, let's say, that's dedicated to allowing me to uh, bend my index finger, if that neuron for some reason doesn't find its target, then I'm screwed. I can't bend my index finger. So what our nervous system does is create far more neurons than it actually needs to innervate our body, let them all grow, and whichever ones don't make it or don't really make strong connections, these are going to get removed. So you make a bunch of neurons, you let them find their way, and the ones that don't find their way, just get rid of them. This way you know every part of the body is going to be innervated by our nervous system. So we, we remove these excess neurons through a process called apoptosis. If uh, you're familiar with apoptosis, that's great. We're not going to go over the details of it. You don't really need to know about caspases or anything like that. You should understand that this is a cell killing itself by activating killer proteins that then cut it up. So here we're going to see uh, a cell undergoing apoptosis. You'll see it's, it's swift, it's painless. Um, the red signal here is showing you the mitochondria, and the green signal is showing you when they have active caspases. So when this cell turns green, it's toast. Okay, and there you go, done, dead. Once the cell activates this machinery, you can see it's quickly removed. Uh, then it's going to kind of break up into little blobs and the cells around it are going to eat it. In the case of the brain, this will be carried out, of course, by microglia. Okay, so we have a bunch of different divisions of our central nervous system. Uh, this doesn't cover all of them by any means, uh, but it's a pretty decent start. So whenever we start off and we're that little tube with a couple of swellings, well, that's when we only have our forebrain, uh, midbrain, and hindbrain. And what you can see here is that the forebrain is going to be further divided uh, into the telencephalon and diencephalon. Uh, the hindbrain will be divided into the metencephalon and myelencephalon. Uh, and then those portions are going to be even further divided. So we're going to talk about those principal structures on the right there. Okay, you'll see even though we're going to talk about the cortex, the basal ganglia, and the limbic system, um, they're all a part of the forebrain. So is the thalamus and the hypothalamus, right? But those first three are part of the telencephalon. Thalamus and hypothalamus are part of the diencephalon. So we'll start at the top. We'll start on the outside. Uh, the neocortex, also just called the cortex. Uh, it's called the neocortex because it's, it's that six-layered structure. This is a newer form of cortex than other parts of the brain, like the hippocampus. But it's layers of cells. Our cortex is there to process information, to create plans, uh, and then construct 
our consciousness, so our conscious awareness. That's all because of the activity in our cortex. Only cortical activity contributes to our consciousness directly. So you can see here that there are several divisions in the cortex. Now all of them have that same six layered structure. Layer 6 is going to project down to the thalamus and all of these parts, but they're going to receive input from, from different uh, parts of the brain and, and different uh, sensory organs. Uh, for example, our eyes, so our visual input, that's going to go to the back of the brain. So the, the caudal or the posterior portions, that occipital lobe, that's going to receive visual input. And you'll see even that occipital lobe in the back, this is divided into a couple different parts. Uh, we have our primary visual cortex, uh, which the primary visual, the primary auditory, primary gustatory, it doesn't matter. Any primary sensory cortex is going to process very specific features. That's all it's there to pick up. So the primary visual cortex will, will determine the color of something or the angle of a line or which direction something is moving. Is it moving from left to right? Is it moving from, from up to down? Is it moving on a diagonal? Very specific features will be detected. The primary sensory cortex doesn't actually say I'm looking at a, a clock or a cat. That's going to be put together in other regions of the brain in what we call associational cortices. That's where we create our perceptions and store memories of what a cat looks like or a cat sounds like or what a clock looks or sounds like. So the associational regions are going to put together multiple bits of information. So what's the color? Uh, what's the shape? Uh, what's the texture of something? If you felt it, what does it sound like? We put all that information together and we say it's a kitten or it's a puppy or whatever it may be. We construct that by putting together multiple bits of very specific information. So the primary cortices look at the very fine details but they don't see the big picture. We see the big picture in the associational regions. Now those associational regions are going to get those uh, are going to get information from the primary cortices because of those intracortical connections in layers two and three. We have sensory cortices, we also have motor cortices. So the pre-motor cortex, um, that is immediately rostral or anterior to the primary motor cortex. The primary motor cortex is concerned with telling individual parts of our body what to do. So move your finger this much, move your hand this much, move your elbow this much. Those plans come from the premotor cortex. They're in the frontal lobe. And what you'll find out as you learn more about the brain is that the frontal lobe is the part of, uh, that, that constructs our consciousness and creates plans. And it's really that prefrontal cortex in the very, very front uh, of our brain that, that's going to create our consciousness uh, make plans and kind of put everything together for us. So the premotor cortex um, receives that input from the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex receives input from all the sensory cortices so it knows what's going on uh, in the world around us. It receives input from lower portions of the brain that tell us our emotions and our drives and then it creates a plan which it tells the premotor cortex the premotor cort cortex then translates that plan uh, for the primary motor cortex to control individual parts of our body. So the cortex has a bunch of layers. The cortex also has a bunch of different regions, which as you can see, uh, respond to individual sensory modalities like somatosensation or vision or audition. Uh, and then there's the associational regions that put together the fine details. Now, the connections between our hemispheres uh, are going to be uh, carried out through the corpus callosum. It's just a big old bundle of axons, so it's a lot of white matter. That allows the um, contralateral innervation of our body and the communication between our two cortices. So both sides of the brain have to talk to one another. The left side needs to know what the right side's planning and vice versa. And it's through the corpus callosum that the different parts of our brain uh, can talk to one another. 
Now there are some people who don't have a corpus callosum. It's been severed in what we call a split in what we call a split brain uh, surgery. So they're now split brain patients. And by studying these people, uh, we've seen that actually the two sides of our brain, while they have a lot of similar functions, there are some differences. Most people uh, tend to understand written language using their left hemisphere, whereas they understand uh, visual language and spatial relationships with the right side of their brain. Of course, this can be completely reversed in different people. Um, and even though I'm highlighting differences between left and right brain, there is no such thing as a left brain person or a right brain person. Those terms are bullshit. Just forget about them. Just keep in mind that the left side of the brain tends to have our verbal language areas, but it doesn't always. If you're left-handed, you have a higher chance of it being on your right uh, instead of your, your left side compared to a right-handed person. It's still usually the left, but it totally differs. Anyway, let's have a look at somebody who has this split brain surgery. And what you'll see is that uh, he's, he's, he has to work with different types of information depending on whether or not the left hemisphere gets the input or the right hemisphere gets the input. So hopefully that video played uh, for you. And what you can see there is that uh, the when the word is sent to the right side of his of his brain, he still clearly identifies that 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 this is a, a pan there, but he can't say it. And that's because the the regions of his brain that allow him to speak, so spoken language, that's on the left. The right side of his brain can't tell those language areas what to say, but he can draw it with his left hand there. All right, and that's because the right side of his brain, which controls his left hand, was able to uh, identify what the word was and then create an image of it. Right? Create this spatial understanding uh, of, of what the word means there. Now below the cortex, there's a variety of brain regions. Uh, the basal ganglia is a collection of subcortical nuclei that are all interconnected with one another uh, through mostly inhibitory synapses. They're going to receive uh, input from the cortex, which we just talked about, uh, the thalamus, which uh, we'll get to soon, and the midbrain. So the basal ganglia, it's going to uh, comprise our, our, our striatum, uh, or the, the caudate putamen, the globus pallidus, uh, there's the substantia nigra, uh, there's the subventricular nucleus, um, subthalamic nucleus. There's a lot of different uh, brain regions in the basal ganglia. And if you look at a, a diagram showing you how they're connected, uh, you'll see it's a big mess. It really is. Um, the basal ganglia are going to receive this input from our cortex, uh, and from other brain regions, and they're going to, through uh, communicating with one another, determine what action should we carry out. So if you want to walk forward, should you actually do it? And the way that they determine this uh, is, is by using the neurotransmitter dopamine. So they're going to be regulated by dopamine in general. If you receive a, a burst of dopamine, you will carry out that action, and if you don't, then you won't. So people who lack dopamine, like Parkinson's patients, have a difficult time moving because they, they can't spit out the dopamine needed 
to turn on the basal ganglia and say, yes, carry out that action. Uh, let's have a look at, at uh, the loss of dopamine and the replacement of dopamine and how they affect the ability to move. So hopefully that movie played, and what you can see is a, a, a stark contrast between when uh, when this man didn't have uh, his his dopamine precursor L-dopa and when he did. So in the off phase, he's lacking dopamine. The basal ganglia doesn't get that go signal, and so he he has this typical shuffling gait that you see in Parkinson's patients, very small steps, because he doesn't uh, have the dopamine that he needs to allow the basal ganglia to select the appropriate action of moving the right leg forward, the left leg forward, and taking these normal strides. When he receives his uh, L-dopa, he can then create the dopamine that he needs to allow the basal ganglia to uh, select the appropriate actions. And then he can take nice full steps. Although the gait is a, a little abnormal, it's still much better uh, than that Parkinsonian shuffle. So that's our basal ganglia. It's just this uh, collection of nuclei. So they're not sheets. They're little balls of cells under the cortex. We're still in the uh, telencephalon here, but we're not at the cortex. So under the cortex, we have basal ganglia. It's a bunch of different brain areas that work together to allow you to select appropriate actions. The limbic system is another collection uh, of uh, subcortical regions. But in this case, we're not selecting the appropriate action. What we're doing is forming memories and creating emotions. Okay, um, there are many different parts of the limbic system. Uh, the hippocampus is is a fairly obvious portion of it. Uh, the hippocampus is actually a layered structure, uh, but it's not neocortex. It's not six layers. It's a more primitive form called allocortex. There's fewer layers, but it's still uh, orderly sheets. The hippocampus is going to receive input from a variety of brain regions, and it its job is to uh, create memories about our life, so episodic memories. When your hippocampus is damaged, uh, then your memory function dramatically uh, falls off. The hippocampus is then connected with other regions of the brain through this structure called the fornix, uh, so that we can, um, we can put in sensory information, and then we can consolidate it and send out the memory to be stored uh, in our associational cortices. The emotional circuitry uh, is going to come from the amygdala and the uh, nucleus accumbens. So the amygdala is this little almond-shaped region of the brain there at the tip of the hippocampus, as you can see in this brain diagram. So near the uh, ventral uh, portion of the brain, there's the amygdala. Uh, this is involved in creating negative emotions. Uh, so anger and fear are going to be constructed by the amygdala. Positive emotionality is going to arise from the nucleus accumbens. Uh, this is in the lower portions of our forebrains called the basal forebrain. And activity in the nucleus accumbens is associated with reward uh, or, or pleasure. And so we can put together uh, our limbic system and they're, they're all kind of interconnected together. So your cortex is going to uh, create that conscious awareness. It will communicate with the limbic system shown on the right there. So the nucleus accumbens, the hippocampus, and the amygdala. So the hippocampus will, will take that sensory information, uh, compare it to our memory, 
It will also create a memory of it. Uh, it will it will communicate with the nucleus accumbens and the amygdala. So based on what's happened in the past uh, with I don't know clowns or maybe something that you're afraid of, the our memory of clowns uh, in the cortex as well as the hippocampus might be sufficient to activate the amygdala saying, well, last time I was around clowns, I got really scared, so now I don't want to be around clowns. And the activation of the amygdala can lead to a bodily response through the hypothalamus. We'll see more of the hypothalamus later. Uh, or if you happen to like clowns, then you'll probably instead have greater activation of the nucleus accumbens rather than the uh, amygdala. So the amygdala is going to create negative uh, emotions, but that doesn't mean it's all bad. Uh, it's actually very good to be afraid of some things. It's good to avoid bad neighborhoods that look scary. Uh, or if you're uh, a rat, it's good to avoid cats. Okay, uh, hopefully these, these movies play for you. What we're going to see is uh, a rat uh, that has both of its amygdalae and then another rat that's had both of its amygdalae removed. There's a mechanical cat on the right, and there's a small piece of food shown in this chamber here. They're going to open the doors on the on the left. Uh, you'll see the little rats are poking their head out. Now they come out. The rat on top runs away when the mechanical cat moves. The rat on the bottom shows absolutely no fear, uh, grabs its food, doesn't really care about the mechanical cat, and then heads back to its hole. Uh, the movie's still playing, if it played in the first place. And eventually the rat on top will try again. It'll get scared uh, by the cat. So your amygdala is actually a very good thing in keeping you alive uh, because it can help you avoid dangerous situations. If those movies aren't playing, uh, follow the link. They're, they're, they're worth checking out. Okay, we're moving down further. So now we're, we're out of our telencephalon and we're entering the diencephalon. So our thalamus, uh, you can see, is in the very center of the brain. All right. uh, it's, it's below the corpus callosum. It's above our brain stem, so it's above the pons and medulla and cerebellum. That thalamus is central in our brain, and that makes a lot of sense because it's really just a relay station. So all of our senses for the most part, uh, except for smell, are going to head through the thalamus before they hit our cortex. So that primary visual cortex, for example, it doesn't actually get its information directly from the retina. Instead, it's going to get it uh, from the thalamus. So uh, the sensory cortices are going to uh, receive their input from the thalamus rather than our sense organs. So the thalamus is there uh, to kind of uh, relay this sensory information. Now, different parts of the thalamus are going to relay different bits of information. So the, the thalamus itself is broken down into a number of different nuclei. Uh, for example, the ventrolateral nucleus, so in the ventral and lateral parts uh, of the thalamus, that region is going to relay information between our cerebellum and primary motor cortex. Um, so that's going to help us coordinate our movement. The ventral anterior nucleus is going to do the same thing. It's going to also help us coordinate our movements, but here it's relaying information between the basal ganglia and the primary motor cortex. So while this colored map shown on the right shows no overlap, uh, keep in mind there's a little bit of blurring. Okay, there's going to be some overlap. That primary motor cortex will receive input from different nuclei in the thalamus. But the general relationship is true. So in part A there, we're looking at the thalamus divided into several different nuclei. So there's the kind of peach VL, or ventral lateral nucleus, and the uh, darker orange ventral anterior, or VA. And you can see that they're going to map to different parts of the cortex. Okay, there'll be there'll be completely discrete in this cartoon. In real life, there's a little bit of blurring. Uh, other parts of the thalamus will relay sensory information like the lateral geniculate nucleus, or LGN, that's shown. It's a little dark purple portion of the thalamus there. That's going to relay back to the occipital lobe because it's relaying visual information, whereas the medial geniculate nucleus, you can see is near the lateral geniculate nucleus, uh, it's just a little more medial to it, that's going to relay sounds. Okay, so that's going to go to a different part of the cortex. That's going to go to the auditory portions. 
So part of the job of the thalamus is to relay sensory and motor information. It's also going to kind of keep the cortex running because there are these widespread connections between the thalamus and the cortex. So they have these reciprocal excitatory connections and that's what keeps the level of cortical activity high and keeps us conscious. That's a part of it anyway. Immediately below the thalamus we have the hypothalamus. Hypo just means less or below. So below the thalamus we have the hypothalamus and this is an important relay station uh, between our brain and the rest of the body. So the thalamus is sending around information within the brain. The hypothalamus is taking information from our brain and sending it to our body in the form of hormones. Uh, the hypothalamus does release a couple of hormones directly into the blood supply, uh, but for the most part it's going to act through the pituitary gland. So on the top portion of this uh, you can see the uh, colorful hypothalamus divided into a bunch of different nuclei just like the thalamus. We're not going to talk about them though. That little rainbow uh, of nuclei is going to communicate with the pituitary, which we can see much better in the lower illustration. The connection is going to be uh, through these, this blood supply there, and so hormones from the hypothalamus uh, get taken through uh, this blood supply into the pituitary. So the anterior portion of the pituitary is going to contain these hormone-releasing cells called tropes that will respond to hypothalamic hormones and release their own hormone into the peripheral blood supply so that our entire body can respond. The posterior pituitary, on the other hand, um, doesn't contain tropes. Instead, it contains axons from the hypothalamus allowing the hypothalamic neurons to directly release hormones into our blood supply. Uh, the two hormones here would be vasopressin and oxytocin. Vasopressin is going to control uh, water reabsorption in the kidney, and oxytocin is going to control uh, feelings of closeness and lactation. Um, the hypothalamus, because it can uh, control bodily function, is, is going to be responsible for actually creating the bodily response to our emotions. Uh, for example, the, the stress that we feel uh, in stressful situations or the, the feelings of aggression uh, that we can actually feel in our body, that's created by our hypothalamus. Uh, let's have a look and see what direct stimulation of the hypothalamus can do uh, to create some aggressive behaviors. So in this experiment, what they did was just bypass all the input to the hypothalamus, and they controlled it directly with some electrodes that they implanted. In our brains, uh, the activity of the hypothalamus is going to be controlled by the cortex and the limbic system. And based on what we're perceiving and what our emotional response is, which is created by the limbic system, that's going to then determine which parts of the hypothalamus become active and what behaviors do we then manifest. How do we then uh, feel in our body? So if we know that we're going to have to give a talk to a crowd, we might have a little bit of a stress response. Uh, and that, that feeling that we get, butterflies in the stomach, sweaty palms, that's created uh, through hormonal release from the hypothalamus. Now if we move into the midbrain, uh, here we're going to get into some uh, even more basic functions. So we have uh, another relay station here, but this escapes our conscious awareness. So the thalamus is going to be uh, relaying sensory information to our cortex so that we can become consciously aware of what we are seeing. The tectum is also going to act as a relay, but in this case it doesn't enter into our uh, uh, cortex, and so it remains outside of conscious awareness. 
So the tectum uh, is going to have uh, a couple of different regions, uh, little balls that we call colliculi. The superior uh, or more dorsal colliculi are going to be a visual relay, whereas the inferior colliculi will be an auditory relay. Uh, this will allow us to have more reflexive responses and it can create some interesting behaviors like blind sight. Uh, so here is a, a monkey that's had damage to its primary uh, visual cortex. So the occipital lobe has been damaged. It doesn't actually see these little bits of food consciously. Instead, it's blindly reaching out. Uh, blind sight's documented in humans as well. You can Google that and have a look at people avoiding trash cans and whatnot, even though they're blind as far as they can tell. That's because of these unconscious relays that allow us to coordinate our movements in an automatic fashion without being aware of why we're doing it. So this monkey can reach out and grab the food that's scooting across the table because of the unconscious relays in its tectum. Immediately in front of the tectum, we have our tegmentum, which is really just a collection uh, of, of many different nuclei. There's the reticular formation, and this is a bunch of different nuclei that in general maintain arousal. So we are awake and behaving because of connections between our reticular formation uh, and other parts of the brain. Uh, if, we have a, if we look at a slice through the uh, midbrain here, we'll see a, a these, these different areas that we're talking about. So there's that blue reticular formation. Then there's the gray matter that surrounds the uh, cerebral aqueduct there. We call it the periaqueductal gray. Peri just means around. So it's the gray matter around the cerebral aqueduct. Uh, this is going to uh, regulate our, our sensation of pain. It's also called nociception. And, and then our more aggressive uh, or, or mating related behaviors. Uh, the red nucleus is going to relay information from our cortex uh, and cerebellum uh, to the spinal motor neurons, and this will help us refine our movements. The uh, black portion there, the substantia nigra, which means black substance, this is the region of our brain that uh, is the major source of dopamine. So the uh, shuffling gait that you see in Parkinsonian patients, that's because of degeneration of their substantia nigra those dopamine neurons get lost. Okay, so if you were to compare the substantia nigra in a normal, healthy human and a human with Parkinson's disease, what you'd find is that there's a lot less black substance there. And that's because uh, neuromelanin is a byproduct of uh, dopamine synthesis. So dopamine neurons are going to create not just dopamine, but uh, neuromelanin as well, and that creates the black substance there. So the midbrain is going to be... Uh, a relay, uh, and then it's also going to regulate our movements uh, through that red nucleus, but also through the substantia nigra, which releases dopamine onto the basal ganglia. If we move further down, we're now in the brain stem. So if you think of the brain as a flower, it's a lovely, beautiful, wrinkly flower. The stem of it would be the medulla and pons. And immediately behind those, we have our cerebellum. The brainstem uh, is the connection between our brain and our spinal cord, and this carries out absolutely vital functions. The medulla uh, controls our heart rate and breathing, uh, and this is this is why if uh, if you get shot uh, in the the front part of your head, you can survive that. But if you get shot in the in the back of the throat, for example, which is going to hit your medulla, then you're toast. Okay, uh, so you know a a, a a shot to the head won't necessarily kill you, okay? If it damages your frontal lobes, it will just completely change your personality. Uh, but if it damages the medulla, then you stop breathing, uh, your heart rate's no longer regulated properly, and, and you're not long for this world. Uh, the pons immediately above the medulla also controls some vital functions. It gives us our sense of balance. It also allows us to swallow properly. Uh, it helps us uh, coordinate the muscles that we need to speak. Uh, and then it, it acts as a relay uh, between the uh, brain and the cerebellum. And cerebellum just means little brain. And that's because it looks like its own little brain there. It's wrinkly on the outside, has a bunch of folds. The cerebellum coordinates complex movements like 
putting your finger out and touching your nose. Uh, we're going to see a guy here who has some cerebellar damage. Hopefully the video plays. Okay, I think we get the point. So he had damage to, to one side of his cerebellum, and therefore one side of his body uh, didn't have as, as exquisite of control uh, over, over how, how it moved around. So something which is actually very easy to us, just reaching your finger out and touching your nose, actually requires some fairly complex calculations. How far is my finger from my nose? Is it too high? Is it too low? Is it too far to the left or right? Am I going to smash into my nose? Should I slow down? Am I going to miss the nose? Should I speed up? We don't have to think about any of that. It's our little brain. It's our cerebellum that does all that calculating for us. And so when you have damage to that, your movements become very uncoordinated. So moving on down even further, we enter the spinal cord. We're still in the central nervous system. The spinal cord is going to send that motor output from the brain, so uh, if you want to move your fingers around, well, you're going to ultimately be sending a signal to your spinal cord to say, move my arm, hand, finger, etc. The spinal cord is going to contain gray matter, so the, the neuron cell bodies and their little dendrites and, and proximal axons, surrounded by white matter. So all the myelinated axons are on the outside of the spinal cord. Cell bodies are more on the inside. And of course, they're going to be protected by those meninges that we talked about, as well as the uh, vertebra. The nerves are going to enter and exit the spinal cord at the, at the roots. We have dorsal roots, so dorsal toward the back. That provides the sensory information, the sensory input into the spinal cord. The motor information is sent out through the ventral roots. So when you think about this, you should think about information flowing out, out of the uh, chest there, so out of the ventral portion, and then back in the dorsal portion. These two roots are going to then join together to create the spinal nerves. So spinal nerves are going to have both sensory and motor components to them. That means that a spinal nerve is going to be able to feel what's going on in a muscle and that it's going to be able to control that muscle. This allows the spinal cord to actually carry out uh, its own uh, computations and create very simple reflexes. For example, the patellar reflex. That's what we're seeing here. So if you've ever been to the doctor's office and had them tap on your patellar tendon there, you're going to give a little jerky kick. That's because the, the hammer tapping the tendon causes the quadriceps to stretch. That stretch is going to be picked up by a sensory neuron there in that dorsal root. That stretch is going to be sent into the spinal cord where the sensory neuron will then activate that motor neuron in the quadriceps causing it to contract because that stretch wasn't something that we said to have happen. Okay, this is because a hammer hit the muscle and it stretched without us telling it to. That's essentially an error message as far as our nervous system is concerned, saying the muscle is stretched, it shouldn't have, we should contract it. And so this very simple reflex is set up that once your patellar tendon gets tapped, the quadriceps contracts. And that's to offset that stretch that was created uh, by tapping on that tendon. Anything more complicated than that is going to require the brain. But by requiring the brain uh, to get involved and to process information, that's going to slow things down. So you don't get the immediate response that you do with spinal reflexes. And that's our central nervous system in a nutshell. 
Now we're going to step outside of our central nervous system and talk about our peripheral nervous systems. And this is essentially just the input and output. So our central nervous system is there to process information. The peripheral nervous system, we've actually already touched on a bit. That would be that reflex that we're talking about. So the sensory neurons and the motor neurons, those are creating our peripheral nervous system. And they're creating the portion of it that we call the somatic nervous system. Soma means body. Uh, so the somatic nervous system uh, deals with our body and the part of the uh, body that we control. So our skeletal muscles for the most part. <clears throat> so the somatic nervous system is, is one that we, are, the, that we consciously control or that we're consciously aware of. So the sensory neurons sense the world. Uh, they sense stretch in muscles. Uh, they're going to sense heat from the candle, for example, here. So here's another little uh, spinal reflex. The sensory neuron senses the heat. That is going to get sent in through that dorsal root into the spinal cord. That's going to activate motor neurons in the ventral portion. And that's going to cause us to contract our biceps there and remove the finger from the heat. So we have sensory neurons that sense the world. And we have motor neurons that control our muscles. So they make us move just like motors do, hence the term motor neurons. The autonomic nervous system is exactly what it sounds like. It sounds like it's the, it's the automatic nervous system, and that's what it is. This functions all on its own. It's outside of our conscious control. Uh, you can't create uh, a stress response whenever you want, and you can't make yourself uh, you know, rest and, and digest whenever you want. This is dependent uh, on uh, unconscious brain activity. We can divide that autonomic nervous system into two portions. There's the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems. Sympathetic nervous system uh, creates that fight or flight response. The parasympathetic nervous system is what we call rest and digest. So if you've ever had a big meal, your parasympathetic nervous system is going to get activated because you have a lot of food in your gut. Your, your stomach is stretching out and that's telling us we've just eaten we should send blood to our digestive system so that we can pull out the nutrients from our meal. Of course, we only have a finite amount of blood in our body, so it has to get pulled away from our skeletal muscles. This creates a sluggish feeling, and that's what gives you the itis that's associated with having a big meal. So that, that kind of lazy, sleepy feeling that you get after a meal is because of activation of the parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system will create the opposite feeling, uh, so it will create the stress response, uh, which makes you very much awake and aware of what's going on. It can also interfere with digestion, which is why stress can give us stomach aches because uh, the sympathetic activation will slow down movement of food through our GI tract because both branches of our autonomic nervous system innervate the same tissues. They just have opposite effects on them. Uh, whereas the sympathetic nervous system is going to increase blood flow to our skeletal muscles, the parasympathetic nervous system will decrease it. Instead, it's going to increase blood flow to our gut, and the, and the sympathetic nervous system will decrease blood flow to our gut. Now, those spinal nerves uh, in our somatic nervous system, those are going to connect the spinal cord and body. Okay, And those spinal nerves are going to have both afferents and efferents. Okay? Afferents and efferents. So afferents are going to be sensory nerves. Okay, so they're sending information uh, into our uh, into our central nervous system. Okay, and then the efferents, those are going to then uh, allow us to effect our body. Okay, so those are going to be the motor nerves. Their cell bodies are going to be found in the ventral horn uh, of the spinal cord, whereas the cell bodies of the afferents are going to be in the dorsal root ganglion. So the spinal nerves are going to connect the spinal cord in the body, but we have other nerves. Some nerves come out directly from uh, the brain rather than the spinal cord, and those would be cranial nerves. Okay, there are 12 of them. They are shown there. Unlike the spinal nerves, some cranial nerves only have sensory components, like the olfactory or the optic nerves, so the first and second. Others will only have motor information like the hypoglossal or the accessory nerves so the 12th and the 11th so blue in this case is sensory red is motor 
you'll see that other nerves have both components, like the trigeminal nerve. That's going to control, um, that's going to send in sensory information from our face, and it will also allow us uh, to control some of the jaw muscles as well. So the spinal nerves are going to have those uh, afferents and efferents, whereas the cranial nerves might have one, the other, or both. For the most part, cranial nerves are going to, contain, are going to connect our brain to our face. Uh, and because there's this, this direct connection, that's why we have ipsilateral control for the most part. Um, the exception to this would be the vagus nerve, which actually innervates the, uh, the viscera or the internal organs. Uh, but other than that, uh, we're controlling the head and the neck with our cranial nerves. Okay, so this is, this is a part of that somatic nervous system both our spinal and our, and our cranial nerves. The autonomic nervous system, uh, again, we're dividing it between sympathetic and parasympathetic. Uh, both divisions are going to have little balls of neurons called ganglia in different places throughout our body. The uh, sympathetic nervous system is going to uh, contain its ganglia in a, in a little chain immediately uh, lateral to the spinal cord. So that's the sympathetic ganglion chain. That contains a bunch of cell bodies that then go and create the sympathetic nervous system that actually provide the sympathetic input to the target tissues. Uh, for example, they'll, they'll have their cell body in that sympathetic ganglion chain, but then they'll project to our heart or to our uh, GI tract. The parasympathetic ganglia, on the other hand, are going to actually be found on the target tissue. So you'll find the, the ganglion actually resting on our GI tract, as opposed to being located close to the spinal cord. So the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems uh, differ in their function, but they also differ in where they put their ganglia. Now the reason that they have different functions is because they use different neurotransmitters. The autonomic nervous system is going to use acetylcholine uh, to, com to communicate to the postganglionic cells, but then those postganglionic cells are then either going to use acetylcholine or norepinephrine. The parasympathetic postganglionic cells will use acetylcholine, but the postganglionic sympathetic cells are going to use norepinephrine. It's also called noradrenaline. That might help you remember it because that sympathetic response is usually associated with adrenaline release or something like that. So a stressful situation uh, will actually cause the release of norepinephrine or noradrenaline as opposed to acetylcholine. And that's what's going to cause blood to then rush to our muscles and, and will uh, prime us for fight or flight. On the other hand, if we have uh, more release of acetylcholine onto our tissues, that's going to prime us to rest and digest. That's going to move the blood away from our uh, skeletal muscles and more toward our GI tract. It's going to slow our heart rate, uh, whereas the, the uh, sympathetic uh, nervous system is going to increase our heart rate by releasing norepinephrine. So these two divisions are going to work together to help us uh, maintain relatively stable uh, internal conditions. In other words, it's going to help us maintain homeostasis so that we don't have too high of blood pressure or too low of blood pressure uh, because believe it or not, your, your blood is always being pulled down by gravity. So whenever you stand up, Sometimes gravity uh, will win a little bit. You might get a little lightheaded. You might see stars. But ideally, you don't pass out every time you stand up. And that's because of our autonomic nervous system. If we sense a, a drop in blood pressure uh, in, in our head, then we're going to relay blood from our legs where it's pooling and push it up into our head. So we'll constrict the blood vessels in our legs that's going to push the blood out. We'll open them up in our head so that we can get uh, increased blood flow to our head and uh, prevent us from passing out. This is what we call the barrow reflex. Barrow just deals with pressure. So as the blood pressure changes from standing or sitting or lying down, our autonomic nervous system responds to keep a relatively stable level of blood in our head. Because without that blood in our head, we don't get proper nutrition, we can't fuel our neurons, 
uh, and we can't maintain consciousness. So here's a young girl, uh, hopefully this movie plays, she's gotten up off the couch, she's going to be playing with her dog, making shadow puppets. She has what we call postural hypotension. So in other words, her barrel reflex doesn't work. So immediately before she started this video, she was sitting on her couch. She went from a seated position to a standing position. When she did that, gravity started to pull down on the blood that's in her head. So here she is, she's playing with the dog, her hand makes shadows on the ground, dog sees it, he pounces, uh, and there you can see she passed out. That's due to a lack of blood in the head. Gravity's pulling down on the blood, her autonomic nervous system didn't respond appropriately, and so it pooled in her legs. This made her extremely lightheaded, uh, in fact so much so that she lost consciousness and passed out. By laying down, uh, gravity was no longer working against her. Blood returned to her brain, she regains consciousness, and there she is. So we should all be thankful that we have a properly functioning autonomic nervous system. When we eat a meal, blood will go to our gut. We'll feel a little tired, but it's all for the best. That allows us to fill our blood up uh, with the nutrients uh, that we've obtained in our meal. If we're in a stressful situation, our autonomic nervous system is going to send blood away from the gut. We don't need to digest food now. Instead, we need to get our muscles ready uh, to either run uh, or, or fight for your life. There are many more divisions of the nervous system, uh, and, and a lot of these functions that we've touched on today we're going to cover in greater detail later on. Uh, but that covers it for our divisions of nervous systems. Email me any questions you have, and I look forward to seeing you for the next lecture.